With the recent release of the PS5 and Xbox Series X, the console generation has arrived, and it's taken gaming to the next level. And yet, the best-selling console of all time was actually released 20 years ago, and that was the PS2. A lot of fond memories over this one. What's up guys, I'm Single, but you can call me Nathan. And in today's video, we'll be telling the story of the PS2 and how it defined expectations to become the most popular selling console of all time. The PlayStation 2 was released a grand total of 20 years ago, bringing in the new millennium by leveling up gaming in a way that's never been seen before. The second generation of PlayStation console has long been recognized as one of, if not the best console on the planet. To this date, 155 million PS2s have been purchased. Let's go ahead and put that into context a little bit over some other big console launches over the past few years. Over the course of the last three years, the Switch has moved 65 million consoles. The standard Xbox One sits around 50 million, and the PS4 sits at a more impressive 113 million. None of those numbers are anywhere near the PS2's colossal sales figures. I mean, the Xbox One had sold less than a third of any number of PS2s. Even the entire Nintendo DS family, ranging from the original DS in 2004 to the newest 3DS, falls shy of the PS2 at around 154 million consoles. So how did Sony manage it? There are a ton of different factors that went toward the colossal success of the PS2, but the thing that set it off on the right foot can be easily attributed to the marketing presence of the machine. The buzz on this product is that strong. PlayStation 2. PlayStation. PlayStation 2. The newest, fastest video game system ever. Sony had just come off the back of the PS1, a machine that had cemented their name in the gaming arena and had been incredibly popular amongst buyers. It had been targeted at a broad audience, primarily aimed at hyping up kids so their parents would buy them the console. I was one of those kids. It may look like a harmless bagel toaster, but inside is a deadly donut. Sony wanted to capitalize on that pre-existing audience, but to do so would require a marketing shift. All the kids that had been kids when the PS1 was launched in 1994 would now have been teenagers, and that was six years later. So to bring the very same people back into the fold and maybe catch some older people into the loop as well, the marketing team for the PS2 went all out marketing their new consoles to adults. It was a bold strategy and one that ultimately paid off. Hot Sims, hot tubs, hot action. Brace yourself, the Sims are on PlayStation 2. The target demographic was people around the age of 17, and the theory was that everybody under this age kind of aspires to be 17 anyway, because of older siblings or the premise of things like being able to drive. Then, for those people that were older than 17, it would take them back to their teenage years. To do this, they brought people in like David Lynch, the creator of the phenomenally popular TV show Twin Peaks, to create incredibly strange and eccentric trailers that would heighten intrigued and draw people in. With a solid base of marketing to build off of, Sony already knew that they needed to deliver on the games. One of the core focuses of the team behind the PS2 was try to find and nail as many exclusive titles as possible, both for the launch window and for further down the line. Exclusive games like Tomb Raider had already done well in the PS1, and so relationships like this were set to continue. A deal with EA was released so that only PS2 got games like FIFA and Madden. A team from Sony Music in Japan has reached out to Squaresoft and managed to secure Final Fantasy for the system. Meanwhile, newer franchises were being snagged as well. There are a bucket load of now classic franchises that got their start over the PS2. PS2 is where God of War games were launched, Kingdom Hearts 1 and 2, Shadow of the Colossus, and Unreal Tournament. Incredible franchises that now have an immense pedigree of the PS2 was there where it all began. But there are other things that went to the success of the consoles that are much more deeper than just incredible marketing and the incredible games. Factors that, in the modern days, seem like common sense that haven't really been considered back then. These days, if you want to buy a movie on DVD or Blu-ray, all you have to do is sit back, shove a disc into the drive of your Xbox or PlayStation, and comfortably relax as the movie plays out without a hitch. Back in the year 2000, that wasn't really the case. DVD players were still fresh out of the market, and for the most part, they were incredibly expensive until the PS2 came along. The PlayStation 2 was the very first console to launch with a drive that was compatible with DVDs. 
And considering the fact that it was only launched for around $299, it ended up being cheaper than a lot of DVD players that were already on the market. So why would anyone buy a full price DVD machine when you could just buy a PS2 and have it play movies and video games? For the most part in the States, the DVD player's functionality wasn't really pushed that hard. It was a feature that they mentioned it a bunch, sure, but it wasn't supposed to be their main selling point. Other places, that was a different story. Take, for example, countries like Spain. Historically, Spain didn't have the biggest gaming market, so in countries like Spain, Sony really pushed the DVD player angle. Because of that, the PS2 near doubled the number of consoles that were in the homes, and if the console was in the house, then, well, why not just buy some video games as well? Believe it or not, the PS2's DVD functionality wasn't the only landmark hardware move that made the console so popular, though. There was also the backwards compatibility, which was a function that was much more central to the PS2 and allowed Sony to dominate the market even further. The backwards compatibility of the PS2 was a massive stroke of marketing and engineering. Of course, the PS2 wasn't the first console to do backwards compatibility. That was the Atari 7800, allowing players to use their Atari 2600 library, but it was still something that really built up a lot of success with the console. There was a dual purpose to the PS2's backward compatibility. The first was to appeal to players who might have had a younger sibling who couldn't really play on the console at the same time as the main user. When the PS2 came around, they could just play on the similar console with the same exact games, and no one would be left out. The second, much bigger reason was to appeal to people who didn't want to feel as if their investments had been completely abandoned. The PS1 had been out since 1994, and people had probably bought a ton of games over that time. It would have felt pretty bad to suddenly have that whole library of games become invalid when the new generation rolled around. So instead, Sony just allowed people to keep playing on their PS1 favorites on their newer, better console. All of these incredible improvements led to something completely unexpected happening at launch. The PS2 became so dominant so quickly that its only other real competition was forced out of the market entirely. Sega's errors as a company, though, have been well documented. Its last home console flopped, and it's seen its market share plummet from more than 50% to about 1%. The Sega Dreamcast was the only other console in the market. It had come out in a year before the PS2. But with the PS2 soaking up pretty much the entire available market, Dreamcast was taking out of production just six months later. Suddenly, the PS2 was the only current generation console on the market. The world was their playground and Xbox wasn't entering the fray for another six months. But when Microsoft did eventually and inevitably release their very first Xbox, Sony knew that they had to be wary. I am now loading a claims revolt. I will soon experience complete oneness with an interconnected global community of game warriors. Microsoft had been building PC hardware for years, and they had incredible resources and an almost unrivaled level of expertise. But Sony has something that Microsoft didn't have, something that would lead the PS2 to still be a dominant console of the generation, even though the Xbox was technically a more powerful machine. They had industry experience. The original Xbox was Microsoft's very first attempt at bringing out the console. Before this point, they had to only create PC systems and PC video games. Consoles were a different ballpark. Microsoft managed to generate a lot of excitement with these releases of their Xbox, but it never really managed to knock Sony off of their perch. Instead, it just introduced an even wider audience to gaming as a whole. In the end, the original Xbox console was able to ship 24 million consoles across the world, nowhere close to the PS2 much more dominant market share. Part of this was because Sony was no slouch when it came to keeping up with the competitors. Sure, the Xbox and the GameCube from Nintendo both ended up being a stronger console in 2001, but in 2004, Sony had something else new to share. The PS2 Slim. This version of the PS2 was better than its predecessor in almost every way. It was, as the name suggests, slimmer than its beefy original PS2 counterpart, and included built-in ether port for online play, the first time a PlayStation console had allowed such a function. It put Sony back on the map and fueled sales even further. There were, of course, a bunch of smaller factors that led the PS2 to being a mega success over the years. The controller was probably one of the best controllers that have ever been made. The DualShock 2 was pretty much the same as the PS1 gamepad, with just a few minor additions. The original Xbox pad was pretty terrible, and Xbox GameCube controller, while good at playing games like Smash, wasn't great for most titles. There was also constant prize revisions. The PS2 was on sale for a phenomenally long time. It sold so well that even by the time the PS3 was released in 2006, the PS2 was flying off the shelves in certain regions. Late generation releases like God of War 2 released in 2007 and Persona 4 even later in 2008 just kept consoles moving off the shelves. In 2009, the PS2 was finally down to a low price of $99 and was still selling absurdly well for a console that had been out for 9 years. It would keep selling well too, right up to the launch year of the PS4 2013. This is when they finally ceased production. 
That's right, after the long Xbox and the GameCube were abandoned for more modern counterparts, the PS2 was still thriving. That was the story of the PS2 and how it changed the face of gaming. Were you a fan of the PS2? Should we do a video on the history of the Xbox next? Let us know your thoughts down below. If you want to see more videos such as this, make sure you like, comment, and subscribe, and ring that notification bell. Again, my name has been Nathan Ng. Stay safe, stay healthy, and have a wonderful day. Peace.